I'm delighted to be here. Hello, everybody. I'm Terrence, and uh, I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad you're here. And I hope that you find our time together to be very practical and profitable and enjoyable. I know that anytime you come to a session like this, it's always a transaction, isn't it? A uh, transaction means you exchange something for something. So my hope, and I guess it's yours too, is that what you'll receive in our time together is of greater value than maybe the things that you have to give up. So uh, probably like many of you on the call, I would consider myself an accidental trainer or accidental L&D person. None of us aspire to think that when we grow up, we want to do this for a living. Most of us get to this uh, career through the concept of punishment for good performance. That is, the better job you do, the more work you get. I'd just be curious if you open up your chat window, how many of you are like me and you're here through the concept of punishment for good performance? Go ahead and give me that indication right now. Yeah, go ahead and type those in. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> you bet. Yeah. So, I mean, it's a validation for what we do. But uh, in, in my career, as I look at where I'm at, as you might look at, at the color of my hair, as I'm looking to what's ahead of me, I think I have less road in front of me than I do behind me. But a, a dear colleague and mentor of mine named Roy Pollack, many of you know Roy through the wonderful book, The Six Disciplines of Breakthrough Learning, shared this with me. He said, there are three phases to every successful career. The first one is where you're learning your profession. The next one is where you're practicing your profession. And the third one is where you're giving back to your profession. Many of us are doing all three of these at the same time. I know I am. I'm still learning things about my profession 30 years into it. I'm practicing it day in and day out. But what's important to me is to be able to give back to my profession as well. And uh, I've been working on this presentation for actually 30 years. And to quote the great sage of baseball and wisdom, Yogi Berra, he said, you could observe a lot just by watching. So I thought I'd put in a baseball quote here in honor that last week was, was opening in the start of the baseball season. And you can observe a lot just by watching. And over 30 years in my profession, I've observed a lot and I've learned a lot along the way. And I have been working on this presentation for about 30 years. And what I think I'll bring, the value I might create for you, is some perspective honed over the years. Um, I think there's a difference between opinion and perspective. Everyone has an opinion, but not always everybody has a perspective. And perspective has been honed over time. So what I've learned over these 30 years as an L&D practitioner some of these things, as I share the timeless rules for great learning, some of these have been hard fought. Uh, all of them have been pressure tested and refined in the crucible of the workplace. I think of like a goldsmith or a silversmith when they're purifying the precious metal. They, they put it into a crucible and they melt it. And what floats to the top is the dross that they skim off so that the finished metal is refined and pure and Many of the things that I've done have been refined and hard tested in the crucible. You all know the expression, you learn best when heat is applied, and I've been in some pretty hot situations like the rest of you. Uh, many of the things that I've learned and tried and tested and validated have been taken globally, so they've been scalable. And I've found that these timeless rules work across all world areas. They are transferable around cult across cultures, and they also cross contexts. That means these timeless rules are just as effective and relevant if you're dealing with technical training or interpersonal training or conceptual skills training. These timeless rules have been validated by credible evidence of results in global awards. I, I feel very honored to have led a team that's won some global awards, including the coveted Excellence in Practice Award for, from uh, the Association for Talent Development. Uh, our signature, our foundational leadership course was one of four in one year that was recognized as the best leadership development course in the world. So we'll say it loud, we'll say it proud. I'm very proud of my team and what we've accomplished and the value that we've created. And then finally, these rules that we'll look at still stand the test of time. They are timelessly contemporary. 
But since we're L and D folks here, we'll begin with some context. Context before content is important, and we'll start with a quick assessment to measure what I'll call your CQ. This might be an assessment that you've not done before, but CQ refers to your cartoon quotient. So what I'm going to ask you to do is open your chat panel and answer the question, what do these animated families have in common? This is my self, this is your assessment to measure your cartoon quotient. Go ahead and type in your response in the chat panel now. Oh, they're fictional? They have almost everything in common. I like that. The same voice over people said in different times, the hairstyles. They have pets. Uh, the patriarch is a goofball. These are great. The styling is similar. TJ, you nailed it. Same show, different times. So I grew up uh, watching these uh, first when they had the original runs and then when they went into syndication, and when they went on to syndication as a kid growing up in Chicago, the uh, the Flintstones came on at four o'clock and the Jetsons came on at 4.30. So there's an interesting connection here. They were both produced by the Hanna-Barbera uh, company. Uh, the voiceovers were the same. The musicians were the same. And interesting enough, one was set in the, the Stone Age. Another one was set in the Jet Age. But I found that sometimes I'd watch the Flintstones at four o'clock and I'd, I'd watch the storyline. And then a half an hour later, the, Flint, the, the Jetsons were on and it was the exact same story. It was a copy and a paste. So here's the point here. Um, the, the plot never changed, but the time it was set in did. And I'd like to use that to illustrate our timeless rules for grade training. And here's the point. The, the, the story about great learning has never changed. The plot remains the same. The, the, the storyline is still about delivering results through improved performance. Now, how we go about telling this story continues to evolve. And there are some things about learning that are timelessly contemporary again. They transcend time, they transcend technology, and they even transcend pandemics. So I'm going to walk through these rules. I, I saw 86 more on the entering question, but let's start with this first one. Uh, I would encourage you to take some notes here. If any of these rules jump out to you, I'd like you to type them into the chat window if you find that they resonate with you. One of the most important rules, and that's just the one I'm starting off with as we look at timeless rules for great learning, is embrace the present and the future of learning but do not shun the past. Back in 2016, I was uh, a keynote speaker at the Chief Learning, Us Learning Officer Summit in Phoenix, Arizona. And after my presentation, I went to many of the breakout sessions and I decided to attend a session done by a learning and development peer at somewhat of a competitive company. I was working as Global Director of Leadership and Learning at Emerson Electric at the time. And uh, I went to a session led by somebody else whose company's last name had the word electric in it too. And I wanted to compare and contrast what they're doing and what they're learning and how I might benefit from it. And early on in the presentation, and my counterpart there was probably half my age, someone asked him a question about how he goes evaluating the effectiveness, the efficiencies and efficacies of all of his L&D programs. And uh, the, the person asked the question, referenced the Kirkpatrick model, if you're familiar with Don Kirkpatrick's four levels of evaluation model. And I was a little taken aback by uh, this, the presenter's response to it. Um, and here's, here's what his response was. He said, you've got to be kidding me. The Kirkpatrick model was invented in 1959. It's 57 years old. Anything that old has to be irrelevant. So at this point, my blood pressure went up a little, and I'm thinking, now, wait a minute. Uh, anything that's 57 years old has to be irrelevant. And I'm thinking, hmm, 
Yeah, I know Don came out with that model in 59 and um, I was born in 1959. I'm 57. Anything that old has to be irrelevant. I found over the years that there's a certain degree of what I'll call chronological snobbery to pen a phrase by the author and playwright C.S. Lewis. And this is what C.S. Lewis shares. And I think it's very important for us to remember this quote. I would encourage you to take a picture of it, take a screen capture of it. C.S. Lewis was a novelist, an academic, an apologist, even a theologian. And he said this, beware of chronological snobbery. Nothing is of greater value because it's new, nor is something of less value because it's old. Newness is not a virtue and oldness is not a vice. And I've seen various degrees of chronological snobbery over 30 years in the role now, where something new comes out, and it's automatically assumed that if it's new, whatever it replaced was old, and if it was old, it was bad and is of less value. And that's why I think our time together is so important as we look at timeless rules. Some of them are very old rules, older than all of us, maybe even collectively. But embrace the present and the future, but do not forsake or shun the past. Beware of chronological snobbery. But as we continue to look at these timeless rules for great learning, my recommendation is this. I've personally trained over 42,000 people on five continents over my career, and about 28,000 of them were learning and development professionals, so among our peer group here on the call. But I've also found over my time that before we can begin any discussion about learning and development, we need to make sure ourselves what we're talking about. So make sure that we and others we're discussing know what we mean when we're talking about learning. The word learning began to appear in the industry around early 2003. Uh, historically, we use th uh, the word human resource development or HRD. Um, and I found that the word training began to disappear from most people's vocabulary around 2003, and uh, it was replaced by the word learning. And uh, learning is supposed to be an action verb, and just to, here's a thought for you to react at. Learning, we've taken a transformational action verb and turned it into a mediocre noun. I'd be curious to get your reaction to this. What do you think of this? We've taken what should be a transformational action verb and somehow turned it into a me mediocre noun. Most of us, we are the title in our department or the name under our, our title under our business card is we're in learning or when learning and development. So we've taken a verb and made it into a noun. Google did it the other way. They took a noun and turned it into a verb. So to set the context for any conversation about learning, we need to make sure in our own mind what learning is. And I found this, gang, that if I ask 10 learning and development professionals what learning is, I'll get 17 and a half different answers. So going back into history here, and I'll attribute this to Dugan Laird, really one of the, 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 the forefathers, the pioneers of what I'll call modern day human resource development, or transformed into L&D. This comes from his classic book, Approaches to Training and Development. If you don't have this book, gang, I would encourage you to get it. But there are three drivers of organizational learning, and you can see these wheels turn that deliver performance that drive business results. There's training, there's education, and there's development. And I found over the years that many of us, even in our profession, tend to use these words interchangeably, but they're really not. There's a time and a place for each one of these, but they're different. A couple of years ago, I was delivering a keynote um, session at an ATD annual summit. And one of the board members from ATD came up to me before my presentation and she said, oh, good Lord, I hope that you don't use the word training in your presentation. I hate that word. To me, it sounds like a fingernail on a chalkboard. So don't use the word training at all in your presentation. Well, you know, um, 
I appreciate people's opinions, but I think that comment was really ill-informed. And when I hear things like that, I don't think under, people really understand what training is and what it is it's supposed to accomplish. So we need to decide what's training, what's education, what's development. So here's what we're going to do with the, the help of our producer, Mark Cunningham. Uh, we're going to go off into breakout groups for about the next uh, 10 minutes or so. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do with your newly formed groups. Take 10 minutes and discuss what are the differences between training, education, and development, and why do these differences matter? When we debrief, I'll call on separate groups. One will tell us, I'll have a spokesperson report back what your group decided, what was training. Another group will report back on what do you think is education? And then the other one, uh, the third group, what is development? And then we'll open up the chat line to say, why do these differences matter? So uh, Mark, I'm gonna turn it off to you to send it off. I see that in the chat line, you have these instructions attached as a PDF. So go ahead and go off in the breakout groups. 10 minutes from now, be prepared to share your the answers to this question. Go ahead and do that now. Thanks, Terrence. See you all back here in about 10 minutes. All right, Terrence, I think we're back. All right. Welcome back, everybody. I hope you had a great conversation. Um, let's go through some of these definitions. And I would like to hear from uh, one group if we could get a spokesperson from one of the groups to discuss what did you come up with in terms of what is training? Could I ask you to just go ahead and unmute yourself and whoever unmutes themselves first, you can tell the rest of the group what you talked about. What is training in the context of organizational performance? This is Amy Schrader from group nine. I can speak to what we had discussed. Hi, Amy. Nice to meet you. Um, wow. So group nine, uh, we had a, a kind of a, a collection of different people from different um, different types of training and development organizations. So we had IT and, um, you know, call centers and healthcare and banking. Um, so we had discussed and one of the things that we had decided was training was more task oriented and more procedural, um, getting people to learn how how to do a specific skill for their jobs, whereas the um, education and development was more geared to how um, how to how people think and how to get them to think about something um, in a certain way. So if you are learning a procedure or learning a new task and you deviate away from what the expected outcome is, how, how do they know what to do in those types of situations? So you have to teach them how to think about things that fall outside of the norm. Got it. Got it. Those are some great thoughts, Amy and, and group nine. Well done. Uh, I, I would imagine that in a group this diverse, I think we had 24 breakout groups. Some of those definitions would be the same and there are probably some different thoughts, but let's hear from another group on education. Could I have a volunteer unmute yourself? What did your group discuss in education in the corporate or organizational world? What do we mean by education? Well, I'll, I'll jump in right here. Uh, I think we're group 11. Someone in our group had a brilliant analogy that they heard somewhere else about, do you want your children taking sex education or sex training? Yeah. And, and um, <laughs> I, I thought, and, and thought it just really helped get things going here in our thinking. And that's where we, we were thinking of that, you know, that education is more of the conceptual, the how, the why, the theory. Yeah. And the training is the hands-on and doing and, it, and, exactly and, and that, usually that's a good thing but maybe not not in terms of our, our toddlers and so forth well yeah no i i, I love that uh, analogy when uh, when i came into the field i was using training and education interchangeably uh and, and my mentor said you know you're talking about these as though they mean the same thing and I thought, well, yeah, it goes, uh, but I'm assuming by the way you're asking me, this, they're not. And then he asked me that question too about, you know, how would you feel if your children took a course when they're at school, but they didn't call it sex education, but they called it sex training. I remember where I was when Kennedy was shot. And I remember when Sean Hopkins asked me that question. And since that day, 30 years ago, I've never used those words interchangeably because there is a difference. And we'll conclude in a minute why these differences matter so much. 
Eric and group, thank you very much. Let's hear from one more group. What's development? Who'd like to volunteer? This is Lynn Kissick. I can jump in really quickly. Hi, our group, hello. Um, our group, as we chatted about that, is really taking that education to the next level of really exploring and expanding. You know, identifying the gaps between what we, the knowledge we have and the knowledge we want to have, or the growth mm. we have and the growth we want to have, and then taking that and developing self rather than having development imposed or required mm. as training and education seem to. Right, right. So these are fascinating definitions. One of the takeaways I would like you to have is when you go back into your organization, make sure that you have a clearly defined and agreed to definition of what training is, what education is, and what development is, because these differences matter. And, and here's why. How you do a needs assessment for training is entirely different than how you do a needs assessment for education or development. The instructional design process is different. Uh, how they're facilitated might look the same, but then how you evaluate the results from training is very different than how you evaluate the results from education or development. So these three fields, if you will, within organizational performance produce three very different outcomes. So I'm going to walk you through the well-established definitions. Again, these are found in Dugan Laird's a book approaches to training and development. But when we use the word training in the context of organizational performance, it really means giving employees the knowledge and skill for what they do now. So training is short term. It's focusing on what they do and what they do right now. Now, after we give employees the knowledge and skill for what they do now, we want to go back sometime afterwards and say, are the are the learners performing better as a result of that knowledge and skill intervention? Are they operating with greater efficiency? Are they performing with greater efficacy? So that's what training is. Training is short-term. It's knowledge and skill for what you do now. Education, when we hear the word education, we often think of school or theories or principles or concepts. But in the context of organizational performance in the corporate organizational world, when we use the word education, it means giving employees the knowledge and skill for what they do next. So it's more medium term. The big difference is after they go through that type of program, we're not going to go back and look for performance improvement or a change in efficiencies or efficacies because they don't have that role yet. It's something that they might have to get them ready for the next role, but they don't have that role next. That's kind of, as Eric said, maybe the difference between sex education and sex training. When we use the word development gang, it means the experiences and assignments that grow us. About 90% of any employee's development is not instructional in nature. Yeah, maybe 10% of it involves training, knowledge and skill for what they do now or education, what they do next. But development is rarely instructional in nature. It's a long-term process that happens through like targeted developmental assignments, role rotations. So these differences matter. And on the next slide, on this slide here, here are the actual definitions that, that we really anchor on. Here's what training is. Here's what education is. And here's what development is. Yeah, Molly, you're exactly right. Development happens over time. It's long-term. Education is more medium-term. Training is short-term. So these are significant differences, and these differences matter. But somehow, they've all been kind of lumped into a mediocre noun called learning. Yeah, how does learning fit into all this? Yeah, so if you want to think about it, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question. Let's just say when we talk about learning, learning means these three things. And the purpose of all of these is to deliver results. So when we use the word learning, we might be talking about training, education, or development, but we need to get under the hood and say just exactly what, what is it you're looking for here? Do you want them to be trained? Is this something they do now? 
Is this something they do next? Or is this something long-term that's designed to help them grow? So I think that these definitions are very, very important because again, most of us tend to use these words interchangeably. I've heard some people use it in the same sentence. Yeah, we're going, we're going to train people on this task so they're better educated to be able to do. And I go, well, there's a difference between it. Um, let me ask a, a quick chat question first. We all work very hard in the course of the day. There's no doubt about it, but here's a question. Um, everyone who works produces something as an L and D practitioner, what is your product? I'm not asking what do you do. I'm asking what do you produce? Could you take a minute, reflect on that question, and type it into the chat window? What is your product as a learning and development practitioner? Learning, education, people, a different perspective, experience, storytelling. Hey, I'm going to challenge some of your, your thinking here. My dad raised me and said, Terrence, it's okay to step on people's toes. Just don't mess up their shoe shine. Um, I would suggest that our product is not learning. Our product in learning is the job performance of our learners that translates into business results. What I've seen in working with thousands of learning and development professionals over 30 years, over five continents, is many in our profession see learning as an end. But if you really think about it, gang, learning is a means to an end. And that, that end is improved job performance, delivering business results. So here's a thought for you to consider. Learning professionals do not produce learning. Learning is a means to an end. What we do produce is the means to improve individual and organizational performance that del delivers business results. So my product isn't the course that I designed or the e-learning course that we distribute or the facilitator guide. My product is not the job aids that we produce. My product is the improved performance of learners that delivers business results. And I, I really think that why learning and development practitioners are on the extinction list of times uh, in times of economic constraint and restraint is we've treated learning as an end when it's a means to an end. I'll give you a common example. In one of my prior roles, I asked my team, I, I looked at our portfolio of courseware in leadership development, and I asked my team the question, what are our employees supposed to be able to do as a result of attending these workshops? And the response I got back was pretty consistent. They said, well, we want them to know this. We want them to know this. We want them to know this. And I said, respectfully, that's not what I'm asking. I didn't ask, what do we want them to know? I asked, what did we want them to be able to do as a result of it? So I think one of the most important things I can share with you gained from 30 years of perspective is learning is not an end, but it's a means to an end. And that end is delivering business results. The most valuable tip I think I've learned, I, I learned from Roy Pollack. I've been going with this statement now for about 12 years. This came from his classic book, The Six Disciplines of Breakthrough Learning. If you don't have that book, gang, it needs to be in your Amazon cart by the end of the day. Anytime anybody approaches me with a request for some type of learning, I always smile and I look at them and I say, complete the sentence for me. This learning initiative will be a success when, and fill in the blanks. Now, in about 50% of the times when I ask that question, the first response I get when I say complete it, complete the sentence, this will be a success when, 50% of the time they'll say, you know, that's a really good question. About 25% of the time when I have them complete the sentence, they'll say, well, this initiative will be a success when we run it. I remember I was working with a chief technology officer who came to me with her team for a request for a learning program. And I said, complete the sentence. This initiative will be a success when? And she looked at me somewhat angrily and she said, well, when we run it, stupid. And I, I sat back and I said, look, your answer is not acceptable to me. Not the fact that you called me stupid, 
But learning is a means to an end, not in an end. And if you can't define to me in a clear, cogent, concise, and complete way what the expected results are supposed to be, why would I do this and what would I train them on? So I've been leading with my chin on this on this particular question for 11 years now. It has served me extremely well in almost every business situation. You've all heard the expression, great leaders begin with the end in mind. And when, when we lead with a sentence like this, it helps us begin with the end in mind. Uh, Cal Wick, one of the authors of the book I'm referencing here on the slide says, Historically, learning and development professionals speak in terminologies that are irrelevant to the business learners or to the business leaders. We tend to speak about learning objectives, and what they want to talk about is business outcomes. So, leading with a sentence like this, make sure that we're focusing on the business outcomes, identify the business outcomes, and that working your way back will get us to our learning objectives. Start with business outcomes, the learning objectives will follow. I'd be curious, what's your reaction to that? Start with the business outcomes and learning objectives will follow. If this resonates, go ahead and type it in. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts here. So here's another, another value of, of, of this complete the sentence for me. When you have your executive sponsors complete that sentence, they are telling you expectations. So now you can go back and measure return on expectation after that program has been launched and deployed. They're telling you the expectations now, sometime after you can find out, did we deliver on the expectations? This is return on expectation. Rule number four, I've heard it said that in every fat course, there's a skinny one wanting to get out. Uh, so the rule here is eliminate portion distortion by applying the one third, two third principle. You know, in any training, we'll talk more specifically now about training that education or development here, but in the context of training, you know, anytime you have a great meal, if you're cooking something in the kitchen, you know, to have a great meal, you have to have your key ingredients and you also have to have them in a right proportion to each other. Too much of this and not enough that and it doesn't turn out well. The same thing is true of any impacting training course. There's three key ingredients to a great training course that delivers performance that translates into results. And if one or more of these ingredients is missing or in a wrong ratio, you won't get what we need. The most obvious ingredient of any great training course is the part that we call the presentation. By presentation, we're talking about the delivery of the content. Here's what I'd like you to do. Type in your chat window. What are some of the various ways that we have at our, at our resources to present content in training? Go ahead and type it in. As you're doing it, look at what other people respond to. What are ways that we can present content? So there's video, there's e-learning, it's through the LMS, through slides, through activities. It could be one-to-one, -one, it could be slide decks, hands-on games, lecture, reading, job aids, simulations, blended. Yes, there's, there's hundreds of ways of presenting content, but here's where many in our, our field kind of fall. They think, okay, I've stood up in front of the group, I've shown you 60 slides in 30 seconds, now you're trained. Well, are they? No. Presentation by itself is not training. That's the delivery of the content. So that's one key ingredient, but the next ingredient has to be in place. We need to have application where presentation is the delivery of the content. Application is the practice of the content. Presentation is not training. Really training happens now when learners have the chance to practice the content that was just presented to them. So we've got presentation, application, and now the last ingredient of any great training course is the part called feedback. It's knowledge of results. I learned these principles from an early contributor in L&D named Ralph Langevin, a man up in Ottawa, Canada, whom I had the pleasure of working for for nine years. So knowledge of results, letting the learners know how well they've practiced those newly acquired skills based on the content that they read or received or discussed. 
So these are the three key ingredients of any good training program. But like a recipe, you have your key ingredients, but you have to have them in a right ratio to each other. Remember, too much of this and not enough that, and it won't turn out well. So I'll put presentation by itself because that might be a little bit more distinct. Application and feedback, they really go hand in hand. The learners are practicing the skills and they're getting feedback right away. So here's my question, and I want you to tape, uh, type it into your chat window. Uh, what kind of ratio should we shoot for? What's the best practice ratio time? Do it in the term of a fraction as a percentage. How much time in a great impactful training program should be spent on how much time we spend presenting content to how much time is spent with the learners practicing the skills and getting feedback on how they're doing? Type in your response to that in your chat window. So I'm seeing kind of anywhere from 10 to 30% on presentation and, and up to uh, from 70 higher to application. That seems to be the general consensus. Okay, so that's the best practice. Now here's the hard question. What's the reality? What kinds of ratios are you currently seeing in your organization? 80-10, right, Lisa? What else? What other kinds of ratios are you seeing? 90 to 10. A lot of content, very little practice. Half and half. A lot more time spent on presentation. Yeah, courses like that that, that are top heavy rarely have the impact. So, so the best practice is this. And again, this is honed and refined and defined over, over the last 30 years is in game-changing courses that really improve performance, no more than one third of the time is spent on the delivery of the content, but two thirds of the time is spent with the learners practicing the knowledge and skill and getting feedback on how they're doing. Again, many courses suffer from portion distortion. And what we need to do is follow principles of lean design and cut down the telling time to increase the practice and feedback time. And here are some thoughts about this. I learned these thoughts, I learned these ideas 30 years ago from my then mentor. It says this, in any training program you put on, the learner should be working harder than the facilitator. I remember when I came into the role at Emerson Electric and I was observing five of our facilitators teaching our signature workshop, a leadership course, I found that all five of them were teaching that five different ways, which I think spoke to the design of the course, which we fixed, but everyone was getting a different experience. But the one thing that these five facilitators all had in common is they were working really, really hard, but the learners weren't working hard at all. And, and, and so I, I respectfully came to them and I said, look, you're calling this a workshop, but you're the only one working. So the goal is this, in any training program we put on, the learner should be working harder than the facilitator. Or in the learning programs as well, your e-learning programs, the learner should be working hard. Going with that is the, the quote at the bottom of this slide called, expect from your learners what you see them do in training. So think about the courses you're, you're putting on. If all you do is see them smile and nod and take notes, when they get back to work, they'll do a great job of smiling and nodding and taking notes. But that's all they'll be able to do. Um, or in your e-learning program, if all they're doing is press enter to continue or click to go next, when they get back to work, they can do a great job clicking their mouse and maybe getting carpal tunnel syndrome, but that's all they'll be able to do. I gave you the formal definition of training before, knowledge and skill for what employees do now, but I'd like you to, to consider this definition too. This is mine. Training is a place where an employee comes to practice their job. Training is a place where somebody comes to practice their job. I've met too many L&D professionals who view as training is a place where I tell them about their job. Many of you have read the classic book by Harold Stolovich called Telling Ain't Training. The, the title alone is worth the price of the book. Here's another thought around eliminating portion distortion. I, I remember facing a challenge in one organization I was at. They wanted to take our foundational leadership training program, which was 23 hours in person. And the direction was, we want to, you to take it down to six hours. 
and we want to do it virtually and we'll have 400 people on the call at one time because we want to modernize the approach. And, and so I had to ask the organization, now is our, is, is our goal here to give it or is our goal that the learners get it? I'll be really honest with you, gang. The answer to that question defines the value proposition of l and in your organization. Is the goal to give it or is the goal that they get it? What do you think about this challenge? I'd like to get your thoughts in the chat window because that the answer to that question will define l and in your organization. Any other thoughts to this? Is the goal to give it or the goal to get it? Yeah, that they can do it. So that means they get it. Yeah. Okay, so we've looked at, at four timeless rules. Let's Let's look at one more. Put as much emphasis on what happens after training as you do what happens during training. Um, I want to invite you to respond in the chat window now. When um, you offer a program for your employees in the form of a percentage, how much of what they actually picked up in the training gets used back at work? If, if you were to give this in the form of a percentage or in the form of a, 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 a fraction, when people leave your programs, how much of what they got in your program actually gets put to work when they're back at work? Type in there. Lisa, you said 20%. Who else? Brinkerhoff says 15%. You're right. Not enough. Yeah, way to be decisive there, A.B. Yeah, we know not enough. Yeah, this is really interesting. No one knows. So we we hope that they walk away and use all of it, but the reality is very little of it gets used. And in studies done pretty much every two years from 1990 up to present day, starting with uh, James and Dana Gaines Robinson, Robert Brinkhoff, Roy Pollock, Cal Wick, Andy Jefferson, the research shows that when most people go to an instructional program or a complete an online program, at the very best, they use about 14 or 15% of what they got in the training in a way that delivers any impact at the at, at the workplace. Now that's pretty sobering news, gang, because that means 85% of what was ever covered or practiced or discussed in the course goes unused. Um, that's serious. Uh, Roy Polly came up with a fascinating phrase for that. I think you've all heard it. It's called learning scrap. When I came to Emerson 11 years ago, I introduced the concept of learning scrap, and it immediately created a visceral reaction among our executives, because if any company understands what scrap costs, it was a manufacturing company like Emerson. As I tore our factories, I'd look at the, the, the bins called scrap, and there was a zero tolerance for manufacturing scrap, because we know manufacturing scrap diminishes value. But frankly, gang, we need to have the conversation about learning scrap because it does diminish value. And I'm, I'm curious here, we, we know that if they're not using 85% of what they got in training, something is broken and it needs to be fixed. But I'd be curious to hear from you, in your opinion, what do you think are the causes of learning scrap? Why is it that we spend so much time on training only to see so little of it being used? Could I ask you to reflect on that and then type your thoughts into the chat window? Go ahead and do that now. Hmm. Look at that. Yeah, some of you are saying too much content, not enough practice. You're right. If they don't practice it in training gang, they are not going to put it to work back at work. Lack of support, lack of reinforcement. Ineffective learning that presentation heavy, giving instead of getting, lack of follow-up. One that jumps out to me, one of the first ones there, I think it was Fenya, said that many, many times these are treated like an event rather than a process. 
And I would say that that's probably the greatest contributor to, to learning scrap is that we treat these as events and not as a process. So if learning is a process, that implies that there's a before, there's a during, and there's an after. For purposes of our time together, I want to focus on what happens after. The idea is simple. The real work begins when the workshop ends. If you think about it, learning is an input. In fact, if you think about it, training, education, and development is an input into somebody's growth. But we don't do this for inputs. We do it for outputs. And the organizations that are credible, the uh, the learning uh, departments, the learning and development functions that are not on the extinction, uh, extinction list, put as much emphasis on the outputs as they do the inputs. So the uh, idea is simple, and this is a concept I've picked up over the years. It's called the new finish line for learning. And this is the way that we can make move our training from an event to a process. So if learning is a process that implies there's a before, there's a during and there's an after, I'm just gonna share with you a simple discipline that I followed along the ways. And I would say that this, this slide alone can change the game for you and your organization. This slide alone is what got me my last four jobs. I just brought this slide to the interview and I said, here's my approach. And usually the first question was, how soon can you start? This slide that I'm going to walk you through as well um, is what I would say was the simple disciplines that helped us win the Excellence in Practice Award from ATD as having the best leadership development course in the world and the Excellence in, in Leadership Development Innovation Award from Chief Learning Officer. Let's walk through it. The preparation phase. We need to prepare the learners. One simple way of doing that is a pre-workshop video greeting from their facilitator, just welcoming them. We send them a personal workshop planner talking about the business outcomes beginning with the end in mind, the learning objectives. We want all of our learners to have a pre-workshop briefing with their manager before coming to training. How many of you have ever gone to training with no idea why you were going other than the fact that you were told to show up? If that's the case, go ahead and type that in your chat window. Just type in the word yes. Did you ever go to training with no idea why you were going other than the fact that you were told to go? Yes, 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 yes. Many of us. Okay. So here's a simple discipline that world-class L&D functions follow to get the most out of their L&D investments is before any learner goes to training, they meet with their manager. This could be 5, 10, 15 minutes. It could be done in person. It could be virtual. It might even be done individually or in groups. But here's what the manager should do. Talk with the employee. Here's the training you're going to. Here's the purpose of the training. Here's why you were selected to attend. Here's how you and I and our team and our organization are going to benefit. In other words, the business results. Here's what you're going to learn. The learning objectives. Remember, benefits start before objectives. If you think about it, benefits are the end, objectives are the means to an end. Here's where you're going to go. Here's how you're going to get there. And then finally, pay attention to this gang. Imagine the manager telling the employee before training, and here's what I'm going to expect of you when you come back. Because these simple disciplines usually aren't followed, we have a lot of people coming to training that are more prisoners or vacationers than they are explorers. I remember when we rolled out this discipline at Emerson, in the pilot of our course, having this pre-workshop briefing with a manager, I had a person come up to me saying, I've been here 18 years. I, I don't know how many courses I've taken. This is the first time I've ever attended training and been asked to have an expectation ahead of time. I just thought, that's really sad. All this training and coming with no expectations. And he said, and usually the course is delivered no expectations. So I said, well, having followed this process, what are your expectations now? And he said, oh, I'm expecting a lot. So this is an important way to begin to set or frame expectations. The and next, yes. Uh, just quick interruption here, Terrence. Amy asked if you'd please repeat what the personal workshop planner is again. 
Yeah. Hey, Jay, here's an, here's an offer. I will send it to you and I'll ask you to distribute it. But it's a personal workshop planner that, that I send to the learner and their managers that talks about what they need to do together before the training, what needs to be done by both of them during the training, and what needs to be done by both of them after the training. It's a simple one-page document. It's a little checklist. There's probably 15 actions. Each action starts with an action verb. And it's simply... Uh, we the title of the page is how to get the most of your upcoming learning investment. Simple discipline. So, uh, Jay, would you be okay if I sent that to you and you'd send it along? Absolutely. And I'll tell you, gang, this is what the very best do differently than the rest to get the most out of training. Okay, so now we're in the instruction phase. This is where the learners are online or in the group and the training takes place. And again, this is, assumes now that we're following the one-third, two-third rule, avoiding por portion distortion and making sure the learners are practicing it. But uh, something historically has happened at the end of this instruction phase. At the end of the course, the instructor walks around with a stack of papers and puts it in everybody's hands. We hand everybody a certificate at the end of the course. What message are we giving to participants at the end of the course if we walk around the room putting a certificate in their hands? What message are we sending? Type it into your chat window. Yeah, it's over. It's done. Done ski. I like that. You're done. Completed. Well, are they done? Yes or no? Are they done? Oh, you can forget now. I like that, Christy. Thanks. No, you're just getting started. So this is a phrase I need you to start sharing with all your employees. The real work begins when the workshop ends. That's the old finish line. Here's what the best are doing differently from the rest. We now move from the instruction phase into the implementation phase. I'm going to encourage you. Put as much emphasis in the design and the deployment of all your, your offerings on what happens after the training. So the tool, Jay, Jay will send it out to everybody, is how to have a post-workshop briefing with a manager. Focus application. We need to drive learning transfer. There's a number of creative ways of doing this. But the next, we know that learning is most fragile when it's new. Brinkerhoff studies also would suggest that the greatest cause for learning scrap is the lack of a supportive manager. I remember when I, uh, my first job out of university, I was with the feds. I came back from a training program. I actually learned something and wanted to apply it. And my boss said, forget everything they told you in that training. Here's how I want you to do it. Interestingly enough, three months later, my boss sends me back to refresher training because I wasn't doing it. So we need to make sure that organizational readiness is in place and the organization is ready to help the learner transfer those skills. One of my friends calls this implementation phase a relapse prevention strategy. You know, no matter where any of you woke up this morning across the globe where you called in from, the minute you set your foot on the floor, we all woke up to one universal principle, and that is gravity never has a bad day. And at the end of the workshop, we need to make sure that there's a way to help the learners fight the force of gravity to go back and do nothing and create learning scrap. So the idea is very, very simple. The real work begins when the workshop ends and put as much emphasis and, and focus on what happens after the training as you do what happens before and during. And again, I will encourage you to all pick up a copy of the six disciplines of breakthrough learning and you'll you'll get some really good ideas on how to do that. You're free to give me a call and consult with me too. The achievement phase. In, uh, in the way that I've approached this over the last 12 or 15 years, 12 weeks after the learning program, the learners are back in a meeting. We call it the capstone conference. And they're aware of this at the beginning of the instruction phase, but we'll say, you know, these three days together are an input into your development, but we do this for output. So here's what's going to happen. Your most important work isn't what happens over these three days, but what happens over the next 12 weeks. Everything you're going to be doing over these next three days is giving you the foundation to succeed. 
The next 12 weeks will actually determine how successful you've been. So we have what I call a capstone conference. The word capstone means pinnacle or crowning or final piece. Our learners are back together and they report back to their peers and to their facilitator. Here's what I set out to accomplish 12 weeks ago. Here's what I did accomplish. And then finally, here's the impact of what I implemented had on me and my team and my business. And what's amazing about this gang is that just 12 weeks later, I'm hearing relevant, credible, and compelling data about getting level three and level four results. And they're telling me the results. I don't have to justify them. I don't have to prove them. It's the learners coming to me saying, here's what's happened. So I would encourage you to develop this simple discipline and make it standard within every one of your learning programs. It provides an onus of accountability. If you're familiar with the corn Ferry competencies of action-oriented and ensures accountability, it's built right into the operating system here. And it, again, to sum it up, then we go to, there's the new finish line for learning, is when the learners have delivered some results and made implementation efforts. We move from inputs to outputs. By the way, we talked about um, begin with the end in mind. This workshop will be a success when, and then they fill in the blanks. On these capstone calls, I'm hearing the answers to those questions from the learners. In other words, in these capstone calls, I'm now beginning to get compelling, credible data on return on expectation. And then from there, we just get better and we continuously refine and improve. So again, just to sum up this slide, if maybe this is the only slide I could ever share in life, this is it. This slide has gotten me my last four jobs. Um, and this is this slide too, by implementing these disciplines have helped us get some excellence and practice awards as well. So the point, as we wrap up our time, there are timeless rules for great training and great learning. The story about great learning has never changed. Whether it was the Stone Age or the Jet Age, the plot remains the same. Our, our product is improved performance, which delivers business results and creates value. Now, again, how we tell the story continues to evolve over time and some technology, but there are five foundational uh, timeless rules for learning. They're timelessly contemporary that transcend time, technology, and pandemics. So as a summary slide, here it is. I'll have you take a minute and uh, review this slide. I'd be curious to know if one of these rules pops out to you more than others. Go ahead and, and begin to type in some reactions to this in your chat window. I'd love to hear from you. If one of these rules resonates more strongly with you, so for, for some of you here, we've given you a lot of information in, in our, our time together. As you look at these, maybe go for some low-hanging fruit. You know, if one of these rules you can begin to implement right away, that might be low effort and high impact. At the same time, be mindful of the low-hanging fruit syndrome. The best tasting fruit isn't always the low-hanging fruit. To incorporate one of these rules into the what your operations now might be high effort, but it might also be high impact. Um, I'd like you to join me in my LinkedIn network. I'd like to stay in touch. I feel very privileged to share with you uh, 30 years of perspective uh, on this. And again, I, I'd say perspective is different than opinion. Perspective is developed under pressure testing and in the crucible. And if you do these five things, you will be a value creator in your organization. Hey, hey Terrence, we have a great question to follow up on that. Uh, Anna asked, um, do you have tips for understanding if the organization is ready? Yeah, I do. That's probably a whole nother session. I, I would say there's, there's seven things that have to be in place for any employee to perform as expected. One is knowledge and skill. But we can give somebody all the knowledge and skill they ever need to be able to do their job. But we have no guarantee once they leave that learning program, Anything's going to happen unless when they get back to work, it is an expectation. 
You know, we treat a lot of training programs like here's a tip, here's an idea. Um, I think we should start treating training programs more as expectations versus suggestions. Because if we offer it as a suggestion, people are going to take it as a suggestion. But if we say we are training you to expected performance, you're more likely to see it. So I would probably say um, make it a standard, measure them against the standard, give them feedback, make sure there's an incentive and motivation for them to want to perform as expected, and that they have the time and tools and resource to do it. But at some other point, uh, I'd, I'd love to come back, Jay, and talk about the seven things that need to be in place organizationally for employees to perform as expected. That sounds wonderful. I'm sure we'll be having conversations about that. Jay, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay. Well, first of all, let's um, thank Terrence, um, whether you do it through coming off mute and saying thank you, whether you do it from um, chat, whether you do a uh, reaction, uh, just seeing all of the chat throughout the session. Uh, I, you could tell how much people enjoyed the session. Terrence, I have to chuckle. I was thinking um, as, as you talked, you and I have said more than a few times that we're probably kindred spirits. But when you were, when you were talking about the follow-up, I was thinking of the old process flow joke where they, they show the process flow and then there's that line that says, and then a miracle happens. Oh yes, uh, and and, yeah. and sometimes I think we treat training and development like that's supposed to be our miracle that it's yeah. supposed to somehow happen by magic. So thank you so much for giving us a, a new finish line, mm. and just uh, thanks to Terrence for a great session. Thanks to all of you for sending spending your morning with us and making our learning community so wonderful. So have yeah. a wonderful day, everyone. Uh, Jay, there's been a request for my email address, so I'll put it here. And my follow-up actions is I'm going to send you a copy of the personal workshop planner, and I'll ask you just to distribute it. And then my biggest ask of all is everyone who gets it, use it. And you'll reduce learning scrap and increase learning transfer and begin to see results. That sounds wonderful. Thank, thank you, Terrence. Thank you, all of our learning community members who joined us today. Very much appreciated.